is Where does my help come from? From you, you alone You're reaching out for me You are my savior Lord, I'm not even in this moment 
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen. Of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is under your presence. Oh. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place. Fill the atmosphere Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for To be overcome by your presence, Lord Your prayer
Isn't His presence just amazing? Yeah, let's just sit in this in His presence right now. Oh God, you are so good. You are so good. So welcome everybody. You can be seated. Thank you for, for joining us there in the gathering place. And if you're online watching us live, give us a thumbs up. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know where you're watching us from as well. So, you know, we're getting ready to take up tithes and offerings, of course. Um, but look at this cute little backpack. Is this not so cute? And it is full of good school supplies. So you know that we have an opportunity to take Jesus to others. We are giving away school supplies to the Middale schools to help those that are less unfortunate. And, and um, we have a list out at the table out there of what we're collecting and everything. So if you haven't already, Wednesday is the last day because we are going to deliver these sweet little bags Thursday. So... Bring um, some school supplies if you'd like to participate, you know. Um, you know, just taking Jesus to others, that is so awesome. How many of you like to get outside of your comfort zone? Okay, there might be a couple of people. Right. Most of us hate getting outside of our comfort zone. But you know, taking Jesus to others, it calls us to get outside of our comfort zone. Right? It causes us to reach outside of our little boundaries. And you know, giving is one way that we have to get outside of our comfort zones. But how many of you know that when you get outside your comfort zone, that you grow spiritually, that you grow financially, that you grow with relationships, and you're taking Jesus to others. You know, that is just so awesome. So if you guys would, hold your tithes and offerings. And let me pray over you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that even when, we, when the waves are above our heads, when we feel like we are drowning, we are still in your will. And you are rising us up, Father. I thank you for those that are giving. I thank you for those that are getting outside their comfort zone. I thank you, Lord, that you are just blessing them beyond measure. Father, take these finances and, and go around the world and take Jesus to others with it. In Jesus' name, amen. What's up, Cornerstone? We hope you had a great worship experience today. If you are a first time guest, please text the word hello to 405-266-2242. We would love to connect with you. Don't forget to check in on Facebook. With every check-in, you help support a new ministry every month. There's a lot happening here, so let us fill you in on what's coming up. First Chronicles 16.23 tells us to sing unto the Lord and speak of His salvation from day to day. There truly is something powerful that happens when God's people get together to praise, worship, pray, and intercede on behalf of our city, nation, and world. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing here, August 27th at 6 p.m. Child care will be provided for all kids, kindergarten and under. So come and join us for a deeper night of worship. We hope to see you there. Get ready for our last Cornerstone Family Swim Night. It's tonight from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. We'll meet at Reno Swim and Slide for a fun evening of swimming and hanging out by the pool. Bring a dessert to share with everyone and make sure you invite all of your friends for an awesome night of fun. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be transitioning all of our member data over to a new database. And what that means is that we're going to be sending out emails to all those who are currently serving in a ministry. The emails will include instructions on how to get yourself set up with Planning Center online. Please take a moment to view this instructional video, update information on Planning Center, and add a picture of yourself to your profile. This will enable us to keep better records of all those who are currently involved here. If you do not receive an email in the next couple of weeks and wish to be included on this member database, please let us know as soon as possible. Thank you for worshiping with us today. If you need more information about these events, please see the What's Happening card in the seat back. Check out our church app or go online to cornerstone.tv.
Stone, good to see you guys this morning. And as Shannon said, thank you so much for uh, giving and helping us on our outreach to the schools. We, we love partnering with our schools, whether it's uh, through backpacks and school supplies or uh, through assemblies that we bring in from time to time or through our Middale uh, Teacher of the Year banquet that we do every year. We believe in influencing the influencers and we love our teachers and appreciate all that they do for us. We're going to be praying for all of our teachers as they head back to school. Uh, but glad you're here this morning, starting a brand new series today that I'm very excited about. And we're going to be dealing with the subject of strongholds, how to live free. And I think if uh, the importance behind this is, one of the reasons is, I think people deal with strongholds as much in the church as they do outside of the church. I think people are bound up as bound in the church as they are in the world. And yet the Bible clearly says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. But I believe there are principles from the word of God that we can take and apply to our life so that we can experience greater victory. I want to begin this morning by asking a question, and the question is this, what is a stronghold? Let me give you a couple of definitions. In its most basic form or description, we would say that a stronghold is a fortified place or reinforced place where the enemy gains access into our life. In Old Testament times, when you mentioned the word stronghold, probably uh, everybody knew what it meant, which would be a cave up on the side of a mountain where an enemy could hide or where you could hide for a safe place. And it became very difficult to extract someone from that high ground or from that place. They were embedded, so to speak, in that position. So the Bible talks about good strongholds and bad strongholds. Let me go ahead and list for you what are some good strongholds. Psalms 18, 2 and 3 says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. In whom I will trust, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. That is without a doubt a good stronghold. There's another one mentioned in Psalms 9, says the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble, And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. And then if you go to the New Testament, there are many, many scriptures in the New Testament, I believe over 60, that talk about being in Christ. And so what we're talking about are both of these Old Testament and New Testament are telling us that when we are in Christ, we are in a good stronghold. We are in a fortified place. We are protected And we need to live a life in Christ. But there are also bad strongholds as well. And those are places where the enemy moves into our lives and just basically decides to set up camp. And so let me give you a couple of definitions. A stronghold is anything that holds you back from walking in or experiencing the fullness that God intended for you to have. Here's another one, since we're laying a good foundation here. Any area of your life where you continually experience defeat. Now, let me explain the difference between a stronghold and an addiction. Because there's two different schools of thought or two different points of view. The world uses the terminology of an addiction, whereas the Bible uses the terminology of a stronghold, so to speak. An addiction basically says this, an addiction means that you are powerless or that you are a victim to your problem. It's not your fault. It's in your DNA. You couldn't help it. You are a victim of your circumstance. Whereas the Bible uses the term stronghold, meaning that there is a spiritual dimension to your problem or forces working behind the scenes to trap you. So you see, an addiction says there's no way out. I have to learn how to cope with, how to learn to live with what I'm going through. Whereas the Bible says this, that if I can deal with the spiritual aspect of my problem, then the physical aspect will line up. 
And let me give you an example. I've used this example, but I want to repeat it because I want to make sure that we're on the same page here and we understand. Stories told of a man that was walking down the river walk of a beautiful city, and as he's walking along, he hears a splash and someone screaming from the middle of the river. He dives in and grabs this person, rescues them, pulls them up to shore, and tries to make sure that they're okay when he hears another splash and another scream and sees another victim in the water struggling. He dives in again, brings that person to the shore, getting them safe when he hears another splash and another scream. When he realizes that somewhere up the trail, there's a man pushing people into the river as they walk by. Now, he can continue to stay at that point and deal with the problem at that level of pulling people out of the water, or he can go upstream and deal with the problem. And so many times what we have done is we have dealt with the downstream problem, what we see, without ever laying the ax to the root or getting to the root of the problem. So strongholds, can be divided basically into three different categories. There are spiritual strongholds, which is what we're going to talk about this morning and spend the majority of our time talking about those things that that work behind the scenes against us. And then there are emotional slash mental strongholds. And the reason that I put those two together is because every emotion that we have somewhere down the road will connect itself to a thought. Emotions and thoughts always go together. Emotions don't have thoughts, but they'll connect themselves oftentimes wrongly so to a thought. In other words, if you wake up and you're just in kind of a a spiritual funk or just kind of a depression, then that emotion that you're feeling will attach itself to a thought that says, nobody loves me, the world hates me, I'm not good enough. If you walk into a room and there are some people that are, uh, that are talking and you feel the emotion of, of embarrassment or awkwardness and, or whatever you, however you want to phrase that, your, your emotions will connect to a thought. They're laughing at me. They're talking about me and insecurities will take over. So emotions and thoughts always go together. And then, of course, there are physical strongholds as well that the enemy attacks in our life. And that may be an addiction, it may be a drinking, it may be gambling, it may be sex, it may be whatever, but there are things that develop themselves and attack and fasten themselves into our lives. Spiritual battles and spiritual warfare. So emotional or thoughts and feelings, physical addictions. And so here's the thing. I, I did this in staff the other day. We had a staff meeting, and I was doing some prep for this series, and I said, I want you to list for me as many strongholds as we can think of and identify and put up on the board. Let me just read a portion of the list to you. I want to make sure you get this. Discouragement is a stronghold. Fatigue is a stronghold. Financial strongholds, debt, generational, busyness, laziness, addictions, entitlement, undeserving, complacency, Lack of patience. People have strongholds in their health, immaturity, offense, pride, stubbornness. Nobody here has that. Selfishness, hopelessness. That 930 class was filled with stubborn people. (laughs) Wounded, blindness, deception, no personal ownership, critical spirit, no focus. All of these things are strongholds that we have in our lives. And that's just a portion of the list that we were able to come up with. So what causes strongholds in our lives? Let me, uh, let me give you the long answer, what I like to call the preacher answer. We always like to go around the block when we answer a question. What causes a stronghold in our life? How many of you have in your home a smoke detector? Anybody? Everybody? I hope you have one. They're a good thing to have. In the middle of the night when that smoke detector goes off, there's a couple of things you can do. You can pull the covers up over your head. You can totally ignore it. 
You can get up out of bed, get a chair, and rip that thing off the ceiling and throw it out in the yard. You can curse it, or you can look for the fire. It's your choice. Well, let me try from another angle. How many of you have these warning lights on your car? My dad called them idiot lights, meaning if the light comes on, it's too late, baby. You should have been paying attention. But you have these lights on your car. When that warning light comes on on the dashboard of your car, again, you have a choice. You can ignore it, say that it doesn't exist, not going to pay any attention to it. You can comment about how pretty it is and how it adds to the interior of your car and how much you like that light. Or, or you can get the owner's manual and you can problem solve or you can take it to the mechanic in order to have it fixed. So what I'm talking about here is oftentimes strongholds are problems or symptoms that we have ignored or covered up or in some instances medicated. In other words, instead of dealing with it, we just pushed it down, ignored it, and looked the other way. And now you are no longer running your life, but now your life is running you because of the strongholds in your life. Now, I want to make a very bold statement here, and please follow me all the way through on this, and, uh, because I don't want you to misunderstand. Strongholds are a result of sin. Now, it may be your sin, and let's be honest, all of us here have done things to sabotage our own lives. All of us have made bad choices. All of us have done stupid things. All of us have opened doors to things that we should not have opened doors to. And so we know that from doing that, we've allowed sin in and it has become a stronghold in our life. Or it may be because of someone else's sin. Something that someone did that has affected you, it filtered down to you, and now what they have done has impacted your life. You can kind of compare it to secondhand smoke. Even though you didn't smoke the cigarette, you're still having the effects of that smoke in your life or in your face. And then thirdly, there's this thing of what theologians call atmospheric sin, sin around us. In other words, original sin. When Adam and Eve committed sin in the garden, high treason, and they sold out this earth and gave it back to, and gave it to Satan, so to speak. And there's this original sin, the nature of sin, the impact of sin that is in the world. So it's there, but it's always the result. Somewhere it can be traced back to sin. So what I want to do this morning is as we begin to work our way through this series, and I want to focus on primarily this morning spiritual sin and spiritual authority in dealing with that in our lives, spiritual strongholds in our lives. A spiritual stronghold will keep you from believing in God and believing in his power and strength for deliverance from sin. A number of years ago, I, I preached a message dealing with baggage, dealing with things that just hang on to us. And it was an illustrated sermon. And what I had done is, is I took a 15-foot chain that weighed about 20 or 25 pounds, a big chain. I wrapped it around my waist several times and then secured it, then just pulled my shirt over it. So nobody knew that I had this big chain underneath my shirt. And I wore it before service. I wore it in worship. I wore it during the whole time while I spoke that message and, and ministered that message. And at the end of that message, I unfastened that chain and just let it fall to the ground. And I got to tell you, just in the natural, it felt good just to get rid of that. It felt good just to no longer have that thing around my waist. And I want to encourage you spiritually. There's nothing like when you give something to God and say, God, I want you to move in my life. There is a freedom that God will give you right away. But the idea behind that illustration is that you never know what someone's dealing with. You never know what type of baggage somebody is carrying. You never know what type of bondage somebody is struggling with. But we all struggle with something. We all have strongholds in our lives that we need to take authority over in the name of Jesus and experience freedom from that stronghold. Ephesians chapter 6 
and verse 12. It's a great verse of scripture. We're going to refer to several scriptures in Ephesians this morning. But here's what it says. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world. Carol, I'm going to let you be my volunteer this service. Come on up here. And here's what I want you to try to get this morning. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. This is flesh and blood. You can see it. You can touch it. You, can, uh, you, you, you have no problem recognizing that it's in the room. But this is not my problem. See, what I have to understand, when I see someone or see something, and we don't always see the spirit things, but, but listen, it's always what's behind her. She's not my problem. It's the motivation behind her. It's what's pushing her. It's what's driving her. It's what's influencing her. And if all you see is this, you're going to have frustration, not only in your marriage, but in life. If you're always saying, that's my problem, and you're my problem, and you're my problem, you're missing the whole spiritual aspect behind this. See, there are things that we can see that are in this room. But there are, thank you, honey, there are things just as real. <laughs> there are things just as real. <laughs> if that hadn't been on camera, she'd have been down, man. <laughs> but, uh, man, there's no backing away from a video once it's on you, though, right? <laughs> see, because I can see her, and, and so the things that we got to realize, it's what we don't see that are just as real. You can see the people around you, next to you, near you, and you realize they're real, they're here. But just as real are the things you cannot see that are in this room that we are at war against. Reality. Real things. The Bible says that Satan is the prince of darkness. Ephesians 2, verse 2 says he is the prince of the power of the air. Now, let me explain something to you because this is very significant for where we're going. I want you to understand clearly the difference between a prince and a king. The Bible says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's the God of this world. But the Bible also says that Jesus is the king of kings. And when you get this picture and this definition in your mind, it'll forever change how you look at spiritual authority. Because what we do oftentimes is we kind of think that Jesus and Satan are on a level playing field. And we kind of get the idea that sometimes Satan is pulling this way in a spiritual tug of war, and sometimes we're pulled that way, and then sometimes Jesus is pulling harder, and we're, we're pulled closer to Christ, and we go that way. Not the picture at all, not what it is at all. It's not equal footing. A prince only has limited power in the king's kingdom. He can only go so far. There are boundaries that had been established and set. He doesn't have full reign or full run of the kingdom because the king does. Now, there are no limits to the king in the kingdom. There's no limits to what he can do or what he can say or the influence that he can have because he's the king. Another thing that is different in this scenario is that anything that a prince decides or decision that he makes can be reversed or undone by the king. number of years ago, I had a young lady call me on the phone, and she was just kind of expressing some things, and I guess she wanted to just shock me with her lifestyle, and she said, I just need you to know something. She said, I, I'm a Satan worshiper, and I said, okay, why do you want to serve a loser? I mean, it's totally up to you. I don't care. She said, well, I want to because he gives me power. So let me just tell you what I know, that anything the devil gives you power to do, God has given me power to undo. That's called spiritual authority that we have and that we can experience in our lives. See, every believer has been given spiritual authority over the devil. I know some of you say, I've never heard anything like this. I've never heard anything about this. But it may be because so many churches don't teach this. You need to hear it, you need to believe it, because really, and I'm not being uh, 
over-exaggerating here. It is a difference between life and death when you understand the power of spiritual authority in your life. See, Satan doesn't want the, ch- want the church to know because he wants you to continue to be defeated. But this authority, the believer's authority, isn't just reserved for the pastor. It's not just set aside for the evangelist or for the teacher or for church work. This is something that every believer ought to be operating in and every believer ought to have a firm understanding of spiritual authority. Let me give you a few scriptures. In Luke chapter 10, and really the whole chapter, chapter 10, but I just want to refer to a a certain part of it here. In fact, beginning in verse 17, and Jesus sent his disciples out, and here they are coming back. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us in your name. Now, that's significant. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan falling as lightning from heaven. In other words, he fell from his place of authority. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. The words rightly translated there mean demons and demon forces. And over most of the power of the enemy. Oh, y'all read your Bible? Good. No, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any wise hurt you. Now, when you take that scripture, and don't just read over, that's not just a a Bible time back in the day, old school scripture. That is something that we need today because we are engaged and locked into a spiritual battle right now. And just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it isn't real. Just because you you aren't aware of it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and it's either working for you or against you. In Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, uh, verse 17, it says, and these signs shall accompany them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out demons. Pastor, are you saying demons are still around? Listen, Jesus dealt with demons 2,000 years ago, a significant part of his ministry. And to think that they just disappeared is not a realistic thought. Demons and demon forces exist. Hold on, lost my place. And these signs shall accompany them that believe. They shall cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. Uh Uh-uh. Someone asked me once, what do you think about handling snakes? I I think it's a a waste of good anointing. Don't do it. Just leave them alone. Got other things we can be praying about and dealing with. Just move on, baby. Move on. And if they drink any deadly thing, I shall no wise hurt them. He's talking about power that's been given to the believer to carry forth the gospel and do the work of God. Two things about authority. Number one is this. It comes from Jesus. All the authority that we have comes from Jesus. Jesus had and has total authority over everything. And you begin to read the Bible and you find out it wasn't just demons and demon forces and over the enemy, but he had power over sickness, over disease, over the elements. He rebuked the wind, the waves, the storms. He raised the dead. I mean, anything he spoke to everything with spiritual authority. And we have to understand this principle if we're going to live and want to live in greater victory. The second thing about authority is this. Authority is based upon relationship. The closer relationship you have to Christ, the greater spiritual authority you're going to walk in. The closer you are to Christ, the more powerful you are in the realm of the spirit. Now, here's here's a great thing for a great leadership quote. You might want to write this down. You cannot be in authority unless you're under authority. I know that's another sermon for another day, but there's a lot packed in that little line right there. Now, here's, here's where things break down. This is where the wheels fall off, so to speak. See that many believers oftentimes will pray for others and maybe even go as far as to tell the devil to leave, to lay hands on them, bind the devil or whatever, you know. 
Anybody, know what I, anybody pray that way? Anybody pray with spiritual authority, taking authority in the name of Jesus, binding and loosening, telling the devil to take his hands off, to tell him that he's a trespasser, that he doesn't belong, right? And so what we'll do, pray for me. Yeah, I'll pray for you. And we bind the devil and we cast things out and we break strongholds and we do all of this stuff. But what happens when nothing happens? Right? I mean, we prayed and we spit a little bit when we prayed because those are the really good prayers. You know, you put something behind them. We, we pray and we, you know, we're loud and we bind things and we cast things out and we take authority and we do all of these things and nothing happens. So we just kind of walk away. Okay. I prayed. I did my part. See, we forget the fact is that the Bible calls Satan the lawless one, meaning that he's not a rule follower. Okay, I I don't think you're getting this, so let me give an example here. If somebody calls the police because something's going on and someone's committing a crime, and the police roll up and they see the guy they're committing the crime and the officer gets out of the car and he says to the guy, stop right there, you are under arrest. And the guy says, I don't think so. I don't have time for this. No, I'm not. Does the police officer just go, are you kidding me? Come on, man. You're under, you, you got to get in the car. Come on. He doesn't just say, well, you win some, you lose some. You know what he does? He amps up the intensity. He doesn't take no for an answer. He says, you are under arrest. You are going to jail. Things are going to change. And then whatever force is necessary to take that person into custody is what that officer is going to use. Are you getting the point of where I'm going? The devil is not a law, is not a rule follower. He's called the lawless one. He may not always just roll over belly up because you said in the name of Jesus. You may need to engage in spiritual warfare, pray down some strongholds, break some things, go to war in the spirit. The Bible says the violent take it by force. Some time ago, God had showed me something in prayer, and it really rebuked me. It was a rebuke to me. Because, see, my, my, my spiritual bend is that I am filled with compassion. If somebody falls down, oh, let's help them up. Let's get them going again. Let's restore them. Let's brush them off and get them back, back into the battle again. And I think that's a God thing. I think that's something every pastor should have. But God showed me the weakness in that is that sometimes when someone would fail and someone would fall and somebody would, would fall short and somebody, is it, that I would be so quick to put a Band-Aid on it. And he said, that's all you're doing, you're putting a Band-Aid because you're not letting them deal with the issue. That sometimes when we go through something, we need to get it all out. Sometimes we need to repent. Sometimes we need to be broken before God. Sometimes we need to be at a place that we get all of that out. If you put a Band-Aid on something and there's still poison in there, you've not done anything. And God says, sometimes you got to let people just be on their face. You got to let them cry out to me. You got to let them come to that place of brokenness of where they're ready for me to move into their life. Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, those physical things we see, but against power, spiritual forces, and demonic influences. How many of you have ever watched WWF, the World Wrestling, World Wrestling Federation on TV, otherwise known as fake wrestling? Anybody? <laughs> right? I mean, it is exciting because you, you have these guys and girls and they get in the ring and I mean, the smack talk starts, Right? And then it just begins to escalate. And it gets loud and it gets louder. Then then a punch is thrown and then it's it's a dog fight. Man, game is on. And there are bodies that are being thrown left and right in the ring, out of the ring. I mean, it's just chaos. 
And then there's this one particular guy. I mean, he is getting the beat down of his life. He is beat up, he's beat down, he's throw off, thrown off of this rope, thrown off of that rope, he's kicked, he's pummeled, he's all of these things. And finally, to finish it off, he's put into a chokehold. And you think, game over, lights out. And all of a sudden, this guy finds some strength. Just starts shaking him at this adrenaline. He rips off the, the chokehold and he grabs the guy and he's like a superman. He throws him out of the ring. And it's exciting, but it don't really work that way. Right? I mean, in real life, you don't just break the chokehold at the last minute. Usually you, you tap out or pass out, right? And it's game over. And that's what I'm saying, that in, in the real world, you don't just break strongholds. In the name of Jesus, I'm free. That's the starting place. But sometimes there's warfare that has to go on in order to experience freedom. We have to be aware that we are involved in deep spiritual warfare. 2 Corinthians 10 says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We do not what? War. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Listen to the words that that verse used. Weapons, war, strongholds, warfare. Those aren't the words we use to describe most Sunday morning services because there's no warm fuzzies in that. Those are not hallmark greeting card words. Them's fighting words, and that's what we're engaged in is a spiritual conflict and a spiritual battle. Mario Morello made this statement. He said, we have to be aware that we're involved in spiritual warfare. We have forgotten about the devil, but he hasn't forgotten about us. How many of you know what a humanist is, right? Right? A humanist is someone that doesn't believe in God or doesn't believe in spiritual things. A humanist is someone that just says it is what it is. It's only what I see is that is real. Everything has to be in the physical realm. They believe everything is physical. See, here's my point. Most believers are humanist much of the time. Because they trust more in the flesh than they do in God. Because they oftentimes are going in their own strength, their own intellect, rather than relying on and trusting in God and looking to God. We're just powering through this stuff on our own and pretty much leave God out of the picture. Now, they also leave Satan out of the picture, meaning they don't realize there's our spiritual forces that are work against them. But again, we are in a war, a spiritual war. That's why Jesus said, I beheld Satan as falling like lightning from the sky. And the disciples came back and said, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us in your name. See, having the use of the name of Jesus is spiritual authority of the believer. Every demon in hell knows that name. And we have been given the power of attorney. Now, the power of attorney is when someone signs their authority over to someone else that's going to be a representative of who they are. And that person is now able to do business in their name. And they have full power of attorney, full authority, full, full authority. So they can sign your name, they can spend your money, they can say, well, this is what we're going to do and speak for you, and you are backing them up because you gave them your name. That's what Jesus did for us. He gave us his name, his spiritual authority, and he said, now I send you out into the world, go out into the world. He deputized us basically and said, wherever you see Satan acting up, you show up on the scene, you tell them Jesus sent you, and it's in my name you take authority over those situations. All right, let me bring this to a close for you this morning. Jesus said, I saw the devil lose power whenever you use my name. 
John 4, verse 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He that is in the world is Satan. He that is in you is Christ. See, many Christians still think the devil's running things. He's still calling the shots. He's still naming the plays. He's not. He's not running me. Is he running you? If he is, it's time for a turnaround. He's not running the church. Jesus is the head of the church. And so it's not it is what it is. It's not whatever. God has called us to a place of spiritual victory and spiritual authority, and it starts with the name of Jesus. Stand with me this morning. There is freedom from strongholds. That list that I read a moment ago, and maybe I didn't read your stronghold. Maybe I didn't read the thing that you're dealing with. But listen, these all become strongholds in our life. Lack of vision, procrastination, lack of identity, no focus, no spiritual hunger, critical spirit, no personal ownership, blindness, wounded, hopelessness, stubbornness, uh, discouragement, anger, on and on and on. These things control our lives. Whether it's a spiritual stronghold, whether emotionally we are a wreck and on an emotional roller coaster, and Satan uses those emotions to just kick us from pillar to post, or whether it's something physical in our life that has gotten its claws and roots into our life that it controls us, and there's an addiction that, that it controls us and runs our life and not the other way around. The name of Jesus is key. And I just wanted you to know this morning because I believe the heart of God is for us to know it doesn't have to be that way. We do have authority in the name of Jesus. There is spiritual power that's been given to us. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And you can walk in greater freedom and greater liberty and you can live life at a level free from strongholds in your life. Father, this morning, I pray that what has been said today strikes a chord. God, I pray that it was, wasn't just a message, it wasn't just a speech or a talk, but God, there is some spiritual application to what's been said today for our lives and for our hearts. And Father, I pray for those that are battling strongholds, that today is a wake-up call Today is eye-opening that in the name of Jesus, we enter into this warfare. Look at me just a moment. See, what we've done in the past is, is this. We've said, God, help me. God, set me free. God, deliver me. God, do something about my situation, about my stronghold. And God says it doesn't work that way. See, we want to put the monkey on God's back. And we want to say, God, handle this. Take care of all this. And God says, I've given you authority. You rebuke the devil. You go to war. You engage in spiritual warfare. And God says it's up to us. And what we're doing this morning is simply enlisting people into their own lives that we rise up and say, whatever there is in my life, and listen, everybody's got something, all right? You've heard me say this before. We don't compare our sin with somebody else's. I've got the good sins. You've got the bad sins, okay? My sin is better than your sin. What a stupid argument. Oh, yeah, I sin, but I don't sin like you. Come on. How stupid is that? Poison is poison, and it kills you put it in a nice cup or a tin cup, it doesn't matter. You can drink it out of crystal. It'll still kill you. So there's freedom in Jesus' name. Whatever you're dealing with today, I'm not going to invite you to come forward this morning. When we dismiss, there are going to be prayer partners on this side and on that side that will pray the prayer of faith with you. Matthew 18, 18 will agree with you. And I encourage you, if you need someone to talk to, someone to pray with you, they will be available. But I'm not going to call you for it because I, I know it's a very personal thing and our struggles are real. 
I'm just telling you this morning there's hope through Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you this morning there's greater liberty than you've ever known. You can live freer than you've ever lived in Jesus' name. If you'll take the word of God that we're sharing and begin to apply it to your life and become fully engaged in this battle today. And I'm praying for you. That's where this series is going over the next several weeks. Is about and eyes are closed. Please, if you're here this morning and you find yourself under the stronghold of sin and you want to come to Christ, but you've not been able to come to Christ and there's this spirit of distraction or unbelief or struggle or whatever, and you say this morning, I need to be free. I want to live free from sin in my life this morning. Pastor, when you pray, because I've never made Jesus the Lord of my life, but I'd like to this morning, I'd like to be free from sin and become born again, have a new nature inside of me. If that is you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or step out, but I need to know that you're here as I pray. So if there's anyone here that says this morning, I would like to become a Christian, a Christ follower, would you raise your hand right now? Raise it up high, and I'll see it, and God will see it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. A lot of hands are up. You can put them down. God bless you. Thank you. Because what you did, look at me just a moment, everybody. Just saw this in my mind. When you raised that hand up, it it may have just been emotion. But I'm telling you, in the spiritual, in the spirit, you broke through that heaviness over you. It was like a punch through that oppression and that hand is reaching out and you're breaking through and things are breaking in the name of Jesus. Listen, all of hell is at attention because something's about to happen. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And I always say, you've done the hardest part. You've raised your hand. You broke through. You raised your hand up out of that mire, out of that muck. And that's your belief that caused you to do that. Now we're just going to do the saying and praying part. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. For out of the heart, man believes. And with confession, unto salvation is made from from the mouth. That's what we're going to do. So everyone here, say this prayer with me. We're all going to say it together. But those of you that raised your hand, I want you to really say it. I want you to be fully engaged as we say this prayer together. Repeat this prayer after me. Dear God, today, I'm sorry for the life that I've lived, that I've lived my life without you, that I've run from you, but today I run to you. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. You died for my sin. You took my place. You rose from the dead. And today you offer me eternity with you. A better life. I receive your freedom. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your new life in me. I'm saved and I am forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we just celebrate with them this morning? Just a moment, please. Amen. That's a new beginning. That's not the end. That's the beginning. Now you got to get plugged in and turned on and fired up for God. And we're going to go the distance. Amen. Amen. Guys, we love you this morning. Thank you for listening this morning. Uh, We're going to worship God with this course before we leave here. There are going to be prayer partners on either side this morning. God bless you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place to the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome.
just men By your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the 